Welcome to Speaking Cinema, a serious movie jibber jabber, a movie podcast coming to you live from inside a 20 foot tall crocodile in Hollywood, California. One of many. They're just all over the place. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, Speaking Cinema. That's our name. We're everywhere. I am your host, the Dread Pirate, Captain Jibber Jabber. With me today, as always, the little boy who should just goddamn grow up already, Kevin, and quit wearing those goddamn green tights while you're at it. No. Kind of. <laughs> we are speaking cinema. We pick a movie, talk about it, watch it, talk about it some more for a contextual conversation about the only thing fit to podcast, movies. On the Jibber Jabber Poop Deck today, we continue this season's director buffet by looking at the works of Steven Spielberg, a man of many genres, a man of many stories. He potentially took one of the biggest left terms with this week's film, 1991's Hook. No uh, tagline for Hook, huh? Couldn't find one, really. All the posters just say Hook on it. I guess in in the early 90s, Robin Williams was your tagline. Robin Williams, Peter Pan, Steven Spielberg, blend it all up into a multicolored goop. Yeah, I didn't, couldn't find a tagline for it. One that, uh, if there was one, I didn't like it. Fair enough. Not fit to print. <laughs> <laughs> Starring Dustin Hoffman, Robin Williams, Julia Roberts, Bob Hoskins, Maggie Smith, Dante Basco. Directed by Steven Spielberg. Written by... Nick Castle and James Hart, produced by Amblin Entertainment and distribution by TriStar, which later merged with Columbia, which later was bought by Sony. Does a lot of work with uh, Columbia, old Spielberg. Yeah, he he, uh, he jumps around, but you know he's done stuff with Universal. I think he's done stuff. I think he's the only director who did something with everyone. I think. I mean, he's he's been around Hollywood long enough. Disney, so. he's done stuff with Disney, MGM, Columbia, Fox. Paramount, just, Paramount, Indiana Jones. Uh, then just made who, his own company, who, DreamWorks. Who's other? What's other major studio? Anyone we're missing? Warner Brothers. I'm sure he's doesn't know Warner Brothers. I'm sure he has. Warner Driver, I think, was Warner Brothers. But he didn't direct that. He produ- uh, produced. Oh, he produced that. Yeah. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah, he did. He was a uh, Back to the Future guy. Yep. If you didn't grow up in the 90s and aren't familiar, when Captain Hook kidnaps his children, an adult Peter Pan must return to Neverland to reclaim his past and take on his old foe. That's it. Bold. That's the one. Bold. Spielberg said that he was inspired to make this movie, like many of his films, from the strained relationship he had with his father. Surprise, a, a theme, surprise. A theme throughout his filmography. He also related to the character of a grown-up Peter Pan and overcoming his own fear of flying. Makes sense. Spielberg, the, the critics are saying, you know, he's just a man-boy, obsessed with his youth. Etc. Uh, Etc. This is a movie that directly addresses that. So, Spielberg originally planned on making this movie in 1985, over 30 years ago. But the birth of his first son made him reconsider. Dropped out. You know he has like seven kids. Yeah, he he he, he, he just, just cranked them out. Yeah, he's a he's a real Mel Gibson when it comes to having <laughs> children. How he treats them is very different. I'm sure he's all right. From what everyone says, I've heard any stories. What, from what, what people say about Spielberg. Uh, they say that sometimes you'll jump in front of the bus for him and sometimes you want to throw him under the bus. But it's only in the context of, like, your working relationship. I, for the most part, a lot of people are very, like, he's a great guy. I love him. He flies home, like, every weekend, no matter where he is, to, like, hang out with his kid. Because so, he's rich, he was, bitch. Yeah, exactly. When, when he got the money in camp. Like, when he was filming Munich and they are like, in Greece and Italy and London. It's like, every single weekend he flew home. I, I, read, I read that book, The Men Who Would Be King, about the formation of DreamWorks. Uh-huh. And apparently, you know, in that book is... It seems level-headed, but, you know, you don't know how accurate anything is. But apparently, when he made DreamWorks, his wife was like, listen, you gotta be home for dinner every night. And apparently he did it. He was just like, okay. There you go. See? Good husband. Michael Jackson was originally approached to play the grown-up pan, but he didn't like the idea of an adult pan losing his childhood past. Thank you. God. That's a little telling, I think. A little telling. Director and actor Nick Castle was then tapped, ran into some creative differences with the attached stars Dustin Hoffman and Robin Williams. Castle, can, Spielberg, approached by Tri- TriStar to direct, took the job. Fun fact, Nick Castle played Mike Myers in John Carpenter's Halloween. 
I, I was stunned by that. I couldn't believe it. That's cool. It's cool. Know? Filming occupied nine sound stages at the TriStar lot in Culver City, California. Schedule ran 40 days over budget of a planned 76 day shoot. A reoccurring Steven Spielberg. But this one definitely seems more than your average one. Usually he's like 10, 20 days over budget. We haven't gotten to Jaws yet. Oh, well, all right. <laughs> 40 days over, though? What's interesting is that I think, um, you know, right now we're talking, you know, there's lots of rumors about the Suicide Squad movie being reshot. And, and uh, Rogue One. Rogue One. Coming out. And a lot of information's kind of coming out. And it's stuff that, um, it's very fashionable in Hollywood to be like, reshoots, uh-oh, troubled production, right? It's, it's an easy story. Right, it could, because a lot of bad movies have had reshoots. But the thing is, when a movie is good, no one wants to talk about the reshoots. Yep. And I, there's a director on Twitter that had a really interesting comment where he's like, it's baffling to me to think that anyone who creates anything would think that the amount of time they were initially given to do it, they would be able just to nail it, right? He's like, what person who creates anything would, on day 30 of a 30 day shoot would look back and be like we got it all in the can we're gonna be great there's always something like you know when a movie is done it's common knowledge that directors are always like oh i just wish this one scene i wish we could go back and do this and yep. everyone loves this thing and i just think it could have been better and everyone hates this scene but man we struggled for it and it could have been so much worse and it's like of course that logic would extend to the shoot too yep so it's like, you know, maybe he maybe Spielberg has the cut to go over budget, so the things he needs to reshoot or things that they didn't think they needed but then they ended up needing or the things that they that they wanted to blah 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 blah. He just does it in the production because he has yeah. the sway. Exactly, yeah. He can extend something that far and just doesn't need to go right. back to reshoot. So. Right. And then people, you know, they talk about reshoots are bad. Sometimes a reshoot is this insert shot just doesn't look as good. Like, if you listen to some commentaries, it's like, oh, that insert shot of, like, Walter White's hand on that book? Oh, that's my hand. That's yeah. the director's hand. Right. You know? It's, sometimes that's a reshoot, but you gotta get a camera, build a location, match the shit. Right. It, it costs money. Right. So. You know, I, I think with 10 Cloverfield Lane, there were some reshoots, but they had done a lot of, like, one shots. Like, yep. And they are like, yeah, we just need to go back and get the coverage because... We'll just edit the coverage into the long shot, you know, exactly. or we'll just... It's, it's built into, like, every major movie's budget. Yeah. So. so I just feel like um, that's yeah, that's one of those things where I hope it goes away, where it's like, reshoot, must be troubled. Yep. It's like, thank God they reshot World War Z. Because what they what the, what the was told of us of that original story, dog shit. Garbage. The budget ballooned accordingly, and Spielberg blamed it on him working at a slower pace than normal. Julia Roberts' antics probably didn't help either, being a diva. Running off to Ireland, etc. Allegedly, etc. There are some uh, some stories about they call her Tinker Hell on the set. That's so. a, that's a on set kind of humor that I would I believe that story because it's such a dad joke. Yep. <laughs> and my time, my limited time on film sets, nothing but dad jokes. Oh yeah, big time. It's it's a good environment. I like it. Uh... <laughs> The movie ultimately made its budget back in the box office. Critics were not kind at its release. It has found a new life on home on home video, currently in the '90s nostalgia trend. Big time. I'm uh, interested to see that uh, critics didn't like this. I'm interested about that. Have you never seen this before? We'll get to that. All right. We'll get to that. Okay. I'll As of this recording, it. Hook available on any physical format you want. Digital HD purchase streaming on Amazon Prime Video. So. If you got that sweet prime shipping, get that sweet prime video rolling. On your computer, on your device. Go, 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 go. Get it. Get it. Kev, have you seen and heard of this movie? I have seen it. Had it uh probably the last time I watched it was on a VHS tape. Mm. So it's mm. it's been that long since I've watched it, but when I was a kid, we did watch this movie a lot. VHS got plenty of spins at my house. I have never seen this movie all the way through. I have a memory of watching it on a plane. All right. Which doesn't make any sense because I never flew anywhere really far as a kid. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, we flew to L.A. from the Bay Area, but it, it was you, never... You don't get a movie on that. Yeah, part. so I'm like... <laughs> and I, my memory of the movie is a scene where Robert Williams is yelling at his kid on a plane. So I think I've mixed it up. Okay. Because the scene's on a plane. He's like, grow up, and the kid's like, no, and he throws a baseball bat, yep. baseball uh, ball up, and it hits the thing, and it falls down. Yep. 
So then I'm like, well, I watched a lot of kids' movies while I was getting a lot of dentistry done. So maybe I saw it at the dentist. Like, saw some scenes at the dentist, and, okay. you know, the dentist was in the way, and I couldn't see the TV. Something I miss as an adult at the dentist office. It's like, as a kid, you had, like, TVs and playing cartoons, you know? Sure. Pretty sweet. Had uh, your Highlights magazine. Oh! Doing the amazing. Live for that one, two, three contact yep. magazine. Oh, my God. That's a great magazine. <laughs> the, I learned a lot in that magazine. The trivia page in that magazine. So magnificique. Good. Learned so much. But where I think I really saw it at school was like a was, I saw this movie was a, a rainy day at school. I think they were playing okay. it. I think I watched a couple scenes and I was like, "This is stupid." Totally valid. So. So. But I mean, it's just it's been in the lexicon for a movie that was supposedly not well liked. It's just been around for a really long time. And mm-hmm. like, there's this whole '90s nostalgia booms going on. Fucking Alamo Draft House shows it, and it sells out like all the time. So it's uh also I, I want to put this out there on public record for any girl that can hear my voice. There is a thin line that R E 90s nostalgia. The crop top. We all love the crop top. Nothing wrong with that. Grew up in an Indian culture. Mm-hmm. Crop top, you know, grandma rocked the crop top. I'm not I got nothing against a bare belly. No hate here. High-waisted pants. There is such a fine line between high-waisted jeans and disgusting mom jeans. And mom jeans. Just, ladies, stop. And so if you, if it's, if your jeans are not, A, dark in color, and B, fitted well. I'm not saying tight. Just fitted well. And not, not low Britney Spears early 2000s. Yeah, you don't yeah. need to be trashy. And, well, and if you want to be tra- if you want to wear low, I don't, I don't. That's fine. I'm I'm cool with that. That has its own set of problems. We'll, when that comes back up, we'll get to that. But right now we're in high waisted jean territory. And when you wear baggy high waisted jeans, you just don't look. It just looks. It just looks so mom like. It's mom jeans. There's this lady who works at uh the Trader Joe's that we go to who always wears like. A Trader Joe's t-shirt and mom jeans, and she just looks like someone's mother. And she's like probably young, younger than me. Yep, it's it's gross. It's like you're 25 Stop. and you look like you're 50. Stop. I hate it. <laughs> I, I literally I hate it. Completely agree with you. Terrible. Now I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Enough of that. Yeah, we'll do this for the mom jeans podcast, but uh, where we just say no. Yeah, and also I'm not listen. I got no agenda here. I don't hate... I'm not trying to be like, you know, women do what I want. I'm just saying, I just don't know if you know that you look like my mom in the 90s. Yep. I did, And maybe you want to look like your mom in the 90s. Maybe that's what that... I don't know. I, maybe I'm misinterpreting this. But I just feel like... I see it, and I'm like, you, do you know how frumpy this looks? Frumpy is the exact word for that. Yeah. Frump. Yeah. I'm, no, I'm no hater of women. Which I feel like is a famous last words, but how familiar are you with Peter Pan, Kev? Because I feel like I am culturally familiar in that way that we all are. But if I if you told me to recite the Peter Pan story to you right now, I don't think I could do it. I'm definitely familiar with the Disney movie. Mm-hmm. We had that in our house. The Fox one or the the one where he's a boy. The one where he's a boy. Or is that that's not even Peter Pan? That's you're, you're thinking of Robin, Robin Hood. Hood. Robin Hood. Robin Hood. Um, yeah, yeah. Or the one where no, that's the Green Arrow. <laughs> They're all kind of the same. So yeah, the uh, classic Disney movie, Peter Pan, definitely familiar with that and that story. The play, I am not familiar with at all, and apparently there's a lot of different elements in the play that I just don't know about. So And, it, and yeah, if you ask me to really dig into those and do it start to finish, I probably couldn't tell you. So this is Spielberg's first Strictly for Kids movies. I would argue that E.T. is a strictly for kids movie. You would argue it's I don't not. Think so. That's why we have a podcast. Right now, as of this recording, we're turning to that well with this summer's The BFG coming out this summer. Which that might not even be a strictly for kids movie. It looks like it is, though. See, I, I only watched that first teaser trailer. Right. So I mean, I'm going to see it. I don't care. I, I, don't, I don't think. Let me know how that goes. I don't think. Uh, you know, I don't think Tintin is a kids movie. That's just a, like an adventure movie that happens to be animated. So, I just feel like this one is really his first just a kids movie. Why do you think that 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 is? And you know, he's someone who's made a lot of movies with kids, a lot of movies about kids. 
why do you think that this has a reputation that way? I think his movies that are with kids and about kids deal with some very adult themes and some very interesting looks at not just nostalgia, but Americana, growing up. Like, they really... Like, adults can get as much out of it as a kid can. And I just don't see that as being a strictly for kids movie. Now, I'll get into it in the second half of this one, but I feel this doesn't have those kind of aspirations. Mm. As much. I think that, you know, he. I think he tries to be a Walt Disney kind of a guy where he's making movies for everyone. Yeah. You know, and my lack of familiarity, I can't say if this fits that mold or it doesn't. But, and I also feel like that's something that people say when they don't like a movie, right? So, like... If I don't like this movie, it's for kids. It's a stupid kids movie. Yeah. But if I like this movie, it's a family movie. Yep. So, you know, Pocahontas, animated Disney movie, that's for kids. Cars is for the family. So I think it's a, it's a subtle dig. It's the difference between a comic book and a graphic novel. Yeah, a yeah. comic book is trash. A graphic novel is, a, is, is art. A, a art. Yep. Exactly, Kev. So I think that... That's a that's a a textured insult, like when you call like you know a black guy a thug. Yeah, well, <laughs> well you, and, know. <laughs> you know that's, a, that's I know I know it's, it's like that subtle word change is all it takes to demean right, something. Right, which some you know that's in the we could argue like you know whatever. That's a whole separate thing. We yep. won't get into that now. But I'm saying it's a subtle subtle word play that I think is insulting, trying to insult it by accusing it. Yep. Of being allegedly a kid's movie. Been doing this podcast for over a year now. A year and some weeks. We've never done a Robin Williams movie. This is the first one. Robin Williams, what are your thoughts on him? Both as an actor, comedian. I mean, you know, he he died in recent times. Robin Williams. So, celebrities die. And we always feel sad for it. And it's like, but we... 99 times out of 100, we didn't know these people. To me, Rob Williams, it felt like he was almost part of my family because we just had like an endless stream of Rob Williams movies in my house. Mm-hmm. As I, so we were a kid. We watched Hook, Mrs. Doubtfire, throw some flubber in there every now and then. It's like, so you get that part of Rob Williams. Oh, Mrs. Doubtfire, a movie that. <laughs> I grew up in a Catholic school, homie, and they were not down with the idea of transgender nothing. <laughs> but boy, did that movie just cut through the fluff. You know what I mean? I always remember uh, we were showing it to my my cousin when she was younger. She was born in 94. 94? 94. And um, we were just watching it because, you know, she was over. And um, he's like, oh, she, we're staying with your, you know, Uncle Uncle Frank and Aunt Jack. And she's like, ha, you can't have an Aunt Jack. And I was like, mm, I'll tell you when you're older. So there's there's that moment that you just don't really think about in that movie. So getting back to Robin Williams. So I get a little older, starting to get into film, I discover One Hour Photo. Like, I wanted to drive to Seattle yeah. to see One Hour Photo because that was the only place that was playing One Hour Photo. Similarly, at the same time, Kev, picture in picture, me and my friends driving to San Jose to see One Hour Photo. Yep. Somehow that movie cut through the fluff, too. I don't know how that worked. I have no idea. And then, like, Insomnia, he's branching out, doing more dramatic stuff. And then, get a little older, discover his stand-up comedy. Like, he's a very well-refined stand-up comedian. I probably have his his uh, Live on Broadway special committed to memory. I could probably do it top to bottom, if you ask me to. We've just watched it and quoted it so many times. So when he died, it did really feel like something personal. Like, this is a guy I have known, grown up with, has been part of my life for so long. And so that one, it did hit hard when he was gone. It's it's just so goddamn entertaining. Yeah, I mean, you know, it is that it is that thing, right, where it's like, you know, when celebrities die and people freak out, sometimes it's, I think we have, like, an aversion to that, right? When David Bowie died, right, like, you know, it's sad that he died, I'm not gonna contend that it's not sad right but like i'm not the biggest ziggy stardust fan i'm not the biggest david bowie fan right so to me it's like he died that's that's just a new story but so some people like like someone that emily worked with like had to call in sick to work you know what i mean like he's like i just cried all day and i'm like whoa that's that's crazy Mm -hmm. and i think sometimes there's a we have a disconnect with that because that person didn't mean anything to us necessarily not in a bad way but just in it's 
in the sense that there are things culturally that are not entities to you, right? Like, if you're not familiar with country music, the death of Johnny Cash is not a tragedy. Yep. But if you are, it is. For sure. And everybody just holds that. It's, it is a personal thing for you if it's something close. You know, it's so many people got touched by Prince when Prince died. You know, people were devastated. Right, and I think there was a contingency of people who were like, well, I, Prince hasn't been anything since the 90s. And it's like, well, but to you, it Prince hasn't been anything pop culturally making headlines in the 90s. He's been around for, mm-hmm. since then Toured forever. extensively. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's like, and I think that with Robert Williams, for our generation, you know, he was the voice of the genie and Aladdin. Yep. He was a funny guy. We kind of grew up with him being a funny guy. He was always the guy at the Oscars that, when as the crowd gets more and more morose, he's has the energy always a high energy dude yep. i feel like people start... always good on talk shows too yes like, you'd yes st- you'd stay up to watch him if he was gonna be on letterman that night you knew it was gonna be funny so. and, and uh he i remember he was on jay leno and he broke the mug and he's like threatening jay leno with a broken mug <laughs> and i thought that was really funny he's also a guy that people i think were it's very easy to be dismissive of him because he had such a rambunctious energy and he yep. was always on and i think people oh, yeah know, i mean it's his worst critics always say, oh, he's just annoying and he's cloying. Right. And, he's, and it just, he just had an energy that nobody could ever match. Part of it was he was on cocaine in the 70s and 80s, but he just, that's just his style right. and is what he's always done. You know? and I, I remember watching Mork and Mindy reruns on Nick at Night when I was a kid mm-hmm. and like just laughing hysterically. It's like he's, he's just funny no matter how old you are. And I remember my brother always just hating him like i remember my brother hating mork and mindy hating them on the inside of the actor studio i mean he gets into his his thing where he just like he took someone's scarf and he just started doing characters you yeah. know like he pretended it's a beard and he's like that he pretends it's like a dress and he's a woman he pretends it's a headdress and he's like a arab dude you know yeah. what i mean and i remember i just remember people was kind of being like fucking robin williams you know what i mean he, he definitely had his demons and he but he seemed like a nice guy i mean he always does those saint jude commercials and stuff yep so, I mean, it, it's sad that he committed suicide. I mean, that's a weird thing. Did you see the commercial he did for uh, the re-release of Ocarina of Time on the Nintendo DS? No. It is like, it'll move you to tears. Especially if you're a father. Which I am not, but I imagine if if you were... Because he, he named his daughter after Zelda. Her name's Zelda Williams. Mm-hmm. And specifically after the video game, because he was a huge fan of it. And it's basically like him opining about like how powerful and beautiful that she is and then you just gotta watch it okay. so and it's it ties into like what makes zelda great what makes being a child great what makes having a child great it's just a very moving spot mm. so hook one of the key cornerstones of 90s nostalgia boom that we're currently in slash suffering through <laughs> alamo draft house you talked about the quote along how do you feel about the 90s nostalgia boom and nostalgia in general? I mean, nostalgia in general is just always fleeting. It's always, your main emotions is always, wow, remember that? That was cool. And then it's gone. So you're not, you're not a nostalgia guy? No. I'm, I just, I'm more, I, I care more if something's timeless. If it still sounds good today as it did 20 years ago, 40 years ago, if it still looks good today as it did 20 years ago, 40 years ago, T-shirt, jeans, cowboy boots, always looking good. That that to me is much more important than just, God, remember this thing? <laughs> that was fun. So I think that's why I have an issue with movies like Dazed and Confused and Grease, where it's like a nostalgia for a time most of the audience for it never even witnessed before. So it's through I, a weird lens. It, what's interesting is I agree with what you're saying. I do like both those movies. But you like Grease. I am stunned by that. Nah, yeah, Grease is fun. I like Grease because right. Grease... I, like, I don't think I like Grease the play, and I think for an upcoming season, we're, we might do Grease Live, that, that special. And I think the, the more Grease I see, the less I'm going to like it. Because, okay. But the, the, the movie Grease is just so uh, bozo for bonkers that I just think that like, I, I like... The, there's okay. like that kind of a thing. Okay. But I do agree with the idea that this narrative that it was better in the past is always chocked full of bullshit, right? Absolutely. It's like, it, and I think it's no better personified than the practical effects are better than CG. It's like, there's a million CG effects that suck and there's a million practical effects that suck. 
good filmmaking is good filmmaking. The tools are just the tools. We've talked about this ad nauseum on this podcast. I will say that the 80s and 90s are terrible cultural deserts that I think contributed minimally to what is good. Mm-hmm. I do I would... not th- do not hold my childhood in that regard as better than what is going on now. If you look at the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon that is going, and this is this is this is a bizarre nostalgia loophole. Stay with me, Kev. 90s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon. Now, a, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon that's 3D animated that is, you know, only exists because of 90s nostalgia. That cartoon made now is better than the cartoon that was made in the 90s in every conceivable way. Animation style, action, fun, humor, awareness of itself, take how seriously it takes, everything is better about it. So I am not someone who pines for the good old days of the 80s and the 90s. I, Two decades I was, one where I was formed in, another one where I grew up in. I completely agree. I just, I'm glad they're behind us, you know. it's We, we should learn from the mistakes and not just revel in the bullshit but, from and it. And, so. and, and I think we're on the same token here where it's like, I'm not saying that there's nothing from those time periods that are good. You know what I mean? There are things that are cool from those time periods, things I like from those time periods. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not sure when people started wearing Doc Martens Again, in my mind, it's the 90s, right? And I think Doc Martens are cool. Terminator 2, still great. Still great. But just this, you know, I'm not looking forward to this whole flannel thing coming back. I don't look forward to mom jeans. I don't look back and think, you know, music was better when I was a kid. Music was not, rap music in the 90s is not as good as rap music is now. That's just my opinion on that. Same thing with rock and roll. I don't think that hair metal nor grunge is something that really keeps my attention. I agree. And by the way, I don't like, I'm not nostalgic for the 90s and 80s and I kind of insulted them a minute ago. There is no more deadening cultural time than the early 2000s. <laughs> that makes the desert of the 90s and the 80s look like a goddamn ocean. Because the early 90s, and it's just fucking Valhalla compared to the early 2000s. Yep. Limp Biscuit, Jinko Jeans. And 9-11. <laughs> not a good time in our lives. Let's just call that the zeros and, I, and move on. I think if anyone is still listening to this, we got to cut this shit off now and just get into this movie. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's get a watch in. Let's get, get some hook going here. Here we, here we go. go. We're back. We're back. From the cultural wasteland that was <laughs> last week's episode, the first half of this episode that we recorded last week. Kev... We watched Hook. How'd you see it? When'd you see it? Amazon Prime, I assume. Amazon Prime streamed for free, you know, with with the Amazon Prime. How, how was the stream? It was Powerful? Good. It was good. Yeah. yeah. It didn't run into any issues. Stayed in HD? Stayed in HD the whole time. Um, yeah. Didn't run into, didn't run into anything. Yeah, I watched it on a Saturday night with uh, Emily and another friend of ours, and uh, they had seen it and I had not. Kev. Shoot, you want me to go first? You want to go first? I always, I always go first. You Kevin, go first. Kevin, Kevin. This fucking movie is horribly wonderful. This is an amazing movie. I love the fuck out of this movie. What in God's name are you talking about? This, this movie sucks. This is going to be... This movie our, sucks. This is already <laughs> our best podcast. After after what we went through last week. This is, It's not perfect. It's no Conan. Oh, no, it's not perfect. It's no Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> Barbarian. But it's highly watchable, which doesn't sound like much, but context in context, I think, is great. Because this is a bold movie, Kev. It's a bold movie. And that's something. It's a bold movie and that's significant. In what way? And, help, help and me that out. they're like, listen. I think this is a very vapid film. They're like, this movie is gonna be Bobo for Bonkers, and we're not st- it's not like if if it's like we're going downhill. And we're just gonna, we're just gonna turn, steer into the turn. You know what I mean? It's like, it's gonna be wacky, it's gonna be weird, and that's what it's gonna be. And we're not gonna make it easy, we're not gonna dial it back for anyone. If you don't like it, sorry. You know what I mean? But really, we're not sorry. You could just leave. You know what I mean? Like, this movie's ma- if you don't like this movie, it's making no concessions for you. No, it's not. It definitely doesn't do that. <laughs> and, you were, and you were alienated by it? It's, I had a lot of the same issues with it even when I was a kid. It's just, I feel it's super bloated. Like, beyond bloated. I think Spielberg is bloated. And I think... I, all, I think all... Uh, Close Encounters, you would argue Hook. 
Close Encounters. E.T. is a very long movie with a lot of uh, twists and turns. What, what are the movies we have done so far? Uh, you thought Munich was bloated. Oh, then, my God. Munich is then, so bloated. But then I proved to you that we need, you need a long time to discuss a serious subject like that. So You we do. We proved it. But I proved I was, it but with science. The difference between this movie and those movies is that this movie does not repeat scenes. I mean, it only has like four sets in it, though. Sure. It but, goes back all the time. Yeah, yeah. But, but every time we're in the set, we're doing something different, right? We're either introducing the Lost Boys Village, then we're training in the Lost Boys Village... Then we're eating Lost Boys Village, and then we're fighting in Lost Boys Village, right? We're never eat. We don't eat three times there. You know what I mean? Munich style. What are you talking about? <laughs> that's that's a terrible analogy. We're not talking you about Munich. Feel bad about that. G- give me your give me. G- let's go back to Hook. Give me your thoughts here. All right. So I just think one characteristic of Spielberg films is you can always tell it's directed by Steven Spielberg. You know, there's always that touch. That certain way he uses the camera, editing, lighting, you can usually tell something's a Spielberg. Film. Also, there's also a scene where parents are talking, but the kids are being annoying in the background. That's like <laughs> everything that he ever does. Pretty standard. Always yeah. like smoky light coming through the window. Well, that's when uh, when he got on with uh, Janusz Kaminski. Yeah. Like that's 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 just Janusz on a plane. Oh, okay, right okay. So that's he, he does that all the time. Mm-hmm. So. And then problems with your dad. Yeah, I mean, there's certain things like that. If you hadn't have told me that Spielberg had done this movie, I would have thought it was like Chris Columbus or some shit. I can see that. You know? It's just, it is absolutely hacky, I think. I don't get a lot of... You don't think it's bold? You don't think that they're they're doing shit here? Dustin Hoffman? Come I mean, on, parents. Stop the charade. Also, <laughs> when he said charade, charade. Okay. I laughed so hard that we had to pause it and rewind. All right. Maybe I was in the wrong mood for this movie. Perhaps. But, okay, here's the thing. So Dustin Hoffman, he's all right. I'd say, well, I'm going to well, go and say, this is Dustin Hoffman's best performance of his whole career. Fuck you. The Graduate? You're going to give this over oh, The Graduate. Get out of best my... Best comedy performance of his whole career. Okay. No, that, that, that's still The Graduate. <laughs> it's not, I mean, that's... Yes, it is. It's a comedy. But that, that's one of those movies that's hard to categorize. No, it's not. It's a comedy. You, you it is it's a, a coming-of-age comedy with dramatic elements. And that's Dustin Hoffman's best performance. All right, well, it ain't Hook. <laughs> so, I, I liked Hook. His right. performance Hook. I think he, he he's selling he's, the he's, t- the titular character. He's chewing the scenery in a way that you should with a guy as flamboyant as Captain Hook is supposed to be. Flamboyant is the word. Yes. Robin Williams is just very inconsistent in this film, and I don't buy him as this magical man boy who can do lots of stuff. It's just, it's a, I get just a weird vibe when he puts the green tights on, you know? Hmm. It's just, it's just odd. And it's oddly structured and it's oddly put together. I don't think it's horribly well filmed. The special effects don't really hold up at all. Oh, well, peace shot. Like, like fucking Tinkerbell just looks blue screened on there. I completely just, disagree with that. Uh, I feel like that's seamless. Lord, no, it's not. <laughs> and I will say the highlight of that is when she gets tossed into the dollhouse and it, and her light lights up every room as she bounces through it. It just doesn't look good though. It doesn't look organic at all. It looks like a special effect. I totally disagree with that. I think they. Right. I think this is some great rotoscoping or green screen or whatever the fuck. All right. I also I realize I'm I I am not familiar with how practical effects really work. <laughs> it's so much easier with this computer. You just do it. Just, uh, that's put, that's put what the, every producer says. Just, put, just give, do it. Make it happen. Give them the, give them the tracking dots. Let's <laughs> shine the shiny ball. Take when we right before we roll, we'll have the shiny ball so we get all the where all the light sources are, and let's go. Just do it. No, um, the sets are very detailed. They look really, they look cool. There's a lot going on in them. They always look like sets. It doesn't I, feel like you can literally. I, I don't know if this is because it's in HD now and they've cleaned it up. You can see like the fucking studio skyline wall in some scene. When they're on the pirate. Like, it, it it feels so big and cluttered, but it feels so small at the same time. I don't think... I don't think you're wrong about that. I, I feel don't... like... It feels like you're walking through Disneyland, not in this... You, you don't feel like you're in Neverland. Ever. But uh, going back into... I, I think that's an app comparison. I think it does kind of feel like that Disneyland aesthetic, you know what I mean? But going back to it, I feel like they're, they're steering into the curve here where that only ever occurs when you're in Neverland. When you're in the real world, it feels like the real world right 
Like, that when they're in London, that feels like a London street. And you feel like you could keep walking down that street if you want. So desired. But when you're in Neverland, it does feel like it's like you got the edge of the ship, you got 20 feet, and then, then that's a painting. Yeah. But I think, and I think that works to the movie's credit. I just, I don't know. When, you, when I can just see that it's a set, it just kills me for it. You know? It just, I can't wrap my head around it. It's like, that's a set. That's just a really expensive set. I, I don't feel transported into this world. Mm. And then part of me even thought if that was intentional because in the beginning of the movie we're watching the Peter Pan play and like, is this just some big fantasy that's going on? You that know? is a question that I want to get into. Let's, I think we need to talk. Let's dig into that. Yeah. You want to do that right now? Yeah, let's do it. So Hook, in their, in their final fight, Hook is like, this is just all a fantasy and you'll wake up from it in a minute. Which... You're like, oh, interesting. But, and then they kind of support that because to me, the guy is the mailman. Yeah. Well, he he's the dude who's sweeping up. Oh, he, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The sweet, he's a suit sweeper. Yeah, yeah. But then, in the end, every all the family is seeing pixie dust and Tinkerbell and flying children and all kinds of weird shit. So it's like, and the mom, but in the, and in the end, it's really weird and kind of inconsistent. The mom who is not clued into any of this as far as we know, sees flying Tinkerbell and her kids flying and Peter Pan and all this shit and accepts it. And it's just like, yep, that, that sounds right. Yep. It's just a weird So do you think that it is a fantasy or do you think it's not? I, see, I just, I can't really tell. I have no idea. I don't, I think other than... And, and it's weird that it's that tonally off to me. I think other than... Hook saying it and us seeing me. There's nothing in the text that makes us think that, other than the fact that Wendy has all of the Peter Pan story like drawn up in the room, which is like, why would you have a mural of Hook, who, a man who you hate, yeah, in your room? But maybe it's like for her children. You know, you could explain that away with stupid kid shit. Yeah, right? and then there's like, like you know, it's also weird in real life how Grandpa fought World War Two and Little Billy plays World War II video games. Yep. I mean, it's kind of <laughs> weird, right? Like, what is the worst day of someone's life? D-Day is like the most awesome level in any video the game. Medal of Honor, man. Yeah, so, you know, like, so life is full of those kinds of inconsistencies. For sure. And then there's like the hook that's like when the kids get abducted, there's the hook drag on, on the wallpaper. Oh, I love that. I mean, that there is good stuff in here. I'm not completely going to shit on this movie. I, I just love the idea that he... He's like, here's where Peter Pan's motherfucking kids live. I am going to light this shit up. Kicks down the door, hooks the wall, and just walks up the whole house, hooking, hooking, turns a corner, moves the hook from this wall into this wall, keeps walking. <laughs> He's like, fuck this guy. <laughs> fuck, the, fuck your couch, dude. I love that. I thought that was awesome. And there's... And the design of that hook is cool too. Like just all the little etching and stuff in it. And he puts then, it on, and all the flash bulbs go off. Yes, it. There is good stuff here. I just think this story is just doesn't know what to do with it at all. Mm. It's just very. I don't really feel like, you know, how did Peter Pan like even just get out of Neverland? Why is he old now? How is he just? forgotten all this how is it is it real is it not real and if it's not real then did he actually well, take this journey to understand his children and realize he's a shitty father I, I think it is real i think it is real because wendy says it's real and everything that we see supports yeah. that it's real mm-hmm. hook is like you haven't been here for a long time what what's wrong with you all this kind of shit um and then peter when he comes it's about Thematically, right? It's about a, which bizarre why it's called Hook. Thematically, it's about Peter Pan as a father having had forgot. Okay, so it's like okay, so the older we get, right? The, now that we see children, we're we're like, what the what the fuck are you talking about, kid? Right? So it's like when the kid's like, I don't want to, I don't want to go in the pool. I, I don't want to get eaten by a shark. You're like, kid, what? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I felt that way when I was a kid. Why? Yeah, there's a part of us that forgets right we, we, as we get away from being a kid you don't want to be a stupid baby anymore so you forget what it's like to be a child and i think that that's what this movie's really about right and it's personified through the ultimate boy who never grew up which is yeah, peter, pan, peter pan right so peter if P- peter pan sells out what hope does anyone have right because okay. like so um you know like when you're a little kid 
you want people to listen to you, but as an adult, you don't want to listen to little kids. You know what True. I mean? And I think that's what this movie's about. He's like, you know, as a as an adult, he's all about his merger and acquisitions of this land thing and how can this owl blah 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 and the kid's like, It's Christmas, you miss my game and he's like, Well, grow up, you know, and it's like, Well, this is what's important to him right now, is yeah. his old world's baseball. It's true. Alright. America's favorite sport that no one likes. It's true. <laughs> that's all that is very true. Um <laughs> hundred games a year and only six of them matter. What? <laughs> Uh, but it just God I had issues with it watching it again. Maybe I was just in a grumpy mood, but and I you, just you're feel in a that, grumpy mood and it never stops. I just feel that story just doesn't come through in any kind of concise way mm. throughout the whole narrative. And then just all the money went into these sets and not a lot of just streamlining this thing to really make it effective, though. So it's just it's very cloying and it just feels very hacky to me, which is something that blows my mind of what Steelberg. You, you think Steel- that you think that anyone else could have pulled off this b- bonko fucking story? They could have. I thought I'm, it, I'm talking about on the. St- I mean, and also this is in the '90s. Now, probably right. We live in an era of of any anything that ties to anything classic. We want to do right. So we did this one movie in '92 or whatever, '91, and then we took you know fucking. 15 years off and now we're doing it again right like yeah. odds great and powerful maleficent in independence day 2 coming out well i'm talking about just what disney's doing where they're readapting okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. readapting adding story to things gotcha. you know we're gonna do i think part of their live action adaptations is a part of this kind of thing where you know what i'm saying like i think at the time if if chris chris columbus was like i want to do this they'd be like get the fuck out of here dude true I don't know. Today? That, that, they, they probably let him get away with it. Yeah. So, I don't know. Just, the whole aesthetic is just weird in that, again, it, just, it always feels like a set, and I think that's completely adverse to this whole we're being transported to another world thing. And it just really hampers it, in my opinion. Uh, uh, I just... Uh, I don't know, man. I just think that it's a, it's a bold movie... And if you're gonna make something, go big. I rather I rather see people go big and fail than not go big at all. I'm I'm all for that, but that doesn't mean it's enjoyable. Sure. Well, this, this movie you talked about Close Encounters of the Third Kind feeling really long. This movie felt like it took forever for me. Yeah, I disagree. I feel like I feel like every scene in this movie moved. Let's yeah. talk. I want to talk about some stuff. And I don't we'll, know. Maybe I've just seen it too many times. Perhaps. Too. Maybe I'm to that point. I think when you watch a movie multiple times. First time you either you love it or you hate it, and if you love it, you're gonna give it another re- you're gonna give it another watch. You're gonna love it again. By third or fourth time, that's when you kind of really start focusing on everything you don't like about it. And I think I just watched it so many times as a kid. Maybe now I'm getting to that time of where I'm just gonna be overly critical about it. I just I can't remove myself from it. Well, let's talk. Let's let's, let's move forward here. Right. Let's talk about something that this movie gets right. That's a very subtle thing. Brownie points. They show what it's really like to fly on a plane. That plane is vibrating, it's moving, there's shaky noises. Every movie, it's like as if, as if you're just like in a building that happens to be moving. It's like, it's not what it's like to be in a plane. Planes are fucking loud and weird. You're and not shitty. getting jostled around and your shit's flying everywhere ah. like it is on this movie. That is like way over the top. Well, no, it only the thing only falls down because the kid hits it with the... No, no, no. Like, I'm talking when they're going through turbulence and like... That's the, what, that's what the, being the, like, turbulence is like. No, it isn't. <laughs> you, you're on that pocket of air and then you drop and it drops like a foot. Yeah. That but, feeling is awful. But there's like the lady trying to eat her dinner and like her sh- shaking and like her milk's going everywhere and she's trying to eat. And it's like that... Is completely silly and completely I, over the top. I'm just saying, planes are flying hallways of uncomfortable buses, <laughs> and they're awful. And I get that in a movie, you know, that it's, it's like you know, scenes are not about that intrinsically. Like you know, like when you have a scene on a plane, it's not always about how awful plane travel is. But plane travel is awful, and I think it's time that Hollywood, you know, gets on their soapbox and shows it for what it is. Also, the drawing that the kid does of the plane crash is. Fantastic! This is me. This is mommy, and this is my brother. It's like, and who's this guy? That's you. You don't have a parachute. Yep. And the plane's on fire. (laughs) If 
if they needed to, to hammer that theme home any closer, it's like this this guy is completely disconnected from his kid. I'm sorry. I mean, this movie is two hours and thirty minutes. I, I didn't know that Spielberg is just he is just not a minimalist when it comes to movies. Nope. He likes them long. That, that guy is two hours plus, like every single. He thing. saw Lawrence of Arabia and he was like, "This is the way you do it." <laughs> he might have, man. This that is the way. It. He loves that. That's dude. one of his movies that before he makes a movie, he he always has like four movies that he watches every time. And it's like Lawrence of Arabia, Seven Samurai, I think Treasure of the Sierra Madre, and something else, you know, or you know. It's something like that, but again, all really long. We should do those movies for this podcast. Yeah, I want to do Seven Samurai. Let's do it. Absolutely. Let's do it. And also, I gotta, I gotta give Spielberg credit. This is the first movie we've watched in all of his movies that we've been doing here, where there is a kid who is not a fucking wiener kid, and we didn't talk about that in Close Encounters of the Third Kind last week. But God damn it, if that kid isn't just a goddamn wiener kid, it's a wiener kid. Don't get me wrong. Oh my god. You don't think uh, the main kid's kind of a wiener kid? Not he's really. Like, wants to abandon his dad and breaks all the clocks. But that's not that. And... I mean, that that makes you a, an angry kid. That doesn't make you a wiener kid. A right. wiener kid's just like a stupid crybaby. Like you know, this guy, he's mad at his dad, but he's not like being stupid about it. He's not the kid okay. from Poltergeist who's like, gotcha, yeah. "Mom, it's gonna rain." It's yeah. like okay, that kid's dude. a wiener. Kid. <laughs> You're a f- little wiener. Like get yeah. over it. All right. Yeah. There's no wiener kid in this one. I'll concede to that. Though. I will also say, like. The, like with a lot of, we haven't talked about this too much either but now now that we've seen so many of them a lot of the women roles in Spielberg movies are very underwritten and I think this, the mother in this movie is no exception yep. but she does have a great uh, uh, monologue where she is talking about how like you're so preoccupied with your own bullshit it's like we have kids they're young now in a couple of years they're not gonna give a shit anymore and then you're gonna lose them and then you're gonna look back and regret your whole life and I feel like that was a very mature moment in this movie that kind of sure. came out of nowhere. I mean, it's probably Spielberg kind of reflecting on his own of, like, this is, as a guy who, my career is basically going on flights of fantasy. He, he even said, I dream for a living. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, he probably did look back and say, I've probably not spent enough time with my own children and been a father, you know. And that is a very mature point, a powerful theme. But... I just don't know if he hammers it home at the end there. Or, like, not hammers it home. Really hit that home run at the end to get that message across. I don't know. Well, it's interesting because it's like when you look at your children, right? You know, when you have a kid, it's like, oh, you're tied to this kid for 18 years, right? But you're, but the first 12 of them, those are the good years, right? Those are the ones where the kid's goofy and likes you and stuff. Well, once it stops pooping itself and barfing on itself, I bet those are the good years. Right, right, <laughs> which is true. Give it up to like four or five, and then it's you teach it all the stuff you like, and then it gets old enough that it can do all the stuff you like, like fishing, baseball, all that stuff. Video games. Video games. Legos. I mean, you never grow out of Legos, but... But it, but yeah, it's but have an excuse like, babe, we gotta get the kid Legos. Exactly. Maybe he'll want the one that I like. Yeah, you know, and then yeah, at twelve, thirteen, fourteen, that's when the angst starts and the growing pain start, and then you gotta go through that all over. So I just feel like that moment was, I think, really good. Another I agree. bold moment, right? Where it's like we're gonna give this soliloquy in the middle of this this opening act here, right? Where it's just like, here's what's going on, motherfucker. This is what you gotta learn. I agree with that. I do think it comes too early, though. I think you got to get... I think, I'm a, I'm a show-don't-tell guy. I think you either save that for Listen right me. when the first act ends or somewhere in the middle where he really has... He's got to have that come-to-Jesus moment. Listen to me. Know? When I pay my two bits for a monster movie, I want to see the fucking monster. I want to see the monster, too. But make him scary. Make what him did, worth it. What did you make of The Lost Boys, a.k.a. Ewok Village, 1991? <laughs> I think, again, it just, it feels like a big set, and it's very, the geography of that set is weird. Oh, no, yeah, it's all There's snow and penguins at one point. Yeah, but that's because it's, it's it's, I agree, it's it's a fantasy land. And I think a lot of the actors they got to play the Lost Boys are very charming. Yes. Especially Short Round. That kid is just pure personality in a big old chubby body. Uh, that's a fat kid? Yeah, it's a big fat Also, the Isn't fat... That short round? That's short round, right? I, no, I thought short round's from Indiana Jones. Oh, fuck. You're right. <laughs> I'm an idiot. That kid is great. Fat kid? Yeah. Fat kid turning into a ball to fight? <laughs> I... Uh, 
that's that is that's pure cinema. Right it's there. pretty funny. That's just awesome. And then the way they do it, where he's like he's like in the front of the frame, and then he ducks down. Yep. And you're like, what happened? And then he just basically scoots out of the way. And they just roll this puppet down yep. the thing. That's perfect, dude. Uh, Christy, friend of the show, her company had an opportunity to buy that prop, and they didn't do it. They are ridiculous. How much was it? Was it crazy expensive? I think it was a couple thousand, so it would have been a lot. And also, I guess there's not really much you could do with it. For them, because they're a party rental company, it's you rent it out for different things, and you can have it on display, you know. But yeah, it's not... You're not gonna roll it around and damage it or anything yeah. like that. So, because if you had a Peter had, Pan party, it'd be great. Had an opportunity to get it, passed it up. Fuck, so. fucked up, you fucked up in '91. You fucked yep. up today. I will also say, and Kev, you know, I'm very sensitive about the the how skateboarding looks in movies, and I'll say it was done well here. Skating their little weird half pipe and Robin oh, okay, running yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. I'd say it was well done. All right, I'll buy that. Rufio kind of gets the short end of the stick. In this uh, movie, though. I, and I, I, and I think that's a it, okay. So Rufio, very divisive character in life, right? Like any guy who has any kind of uneven dye job in his hair is in, immediately Rufio. Rufio. Doesn't matter if it's half half of it's blonde and half of it's black. It doesn't matter if it's long or short. You're Rufio, exactly. And, and if you're kind of like an Asian punk kid, you're Rufio too. <laughs> so Rufio, you know. It's interesting how people interpreted Rufio in life. Yeah. But his character is... He's the head of the Lost Boys after Peter Pan has left. Mm -hmm. He's ragging on Peter Pan because he grew up. Rightfully so. True. Peter Pan beats him. Like trains, you know. Mm -hmm. Eventually beats him. He is a grown man, so I mean, you know, he has an advantage. You would hope he would. Um, kind of buys into the world... And then Peter Pan gets all the glory and Rufio dies. Kind of an unceremonious death. I will say that that is something that really doesn't work about this movie is that Rufio dies and it is thrown away for a sad moment for Peter. Because the climax of the movie is when he realizes that Hook is starting to steal his son. Yeah. Right? That's the climax of the movie. The, the Rufio dying is just to up the stakes. And they, they, yeah, they really throw away his death. And also, none of the Lost Boys really even cares or seems to even notice yeah it's just like oh he died where's rufio not even where's rufio it's just hey we won cool who are you gonna anoint for the next one and then it's like you're not why wouldn't you assume that rufio would get the sword back but they said they give it to the fat kid yeah it's a weird it is i think in a way to improve that would be if they if Peter Pan had no choice but to become the head of the Lost Boys, and maybe Rufio dies a lot earlier, I think that's the way you make that a much more powerful moment. Personally, well, it's also. I mean, I think they. I think they make it a good moment in terms of how the power shift happens because the little the little black kid is like, "Hey, Peter needs to get his family right," and so it's like he's like he's not really trying to lead the Lost Boys. He's like, "I need to lead you to get my kids back, right? I need to convince you to help me." Yeah, and then I need a. I gotta come up with a plan because I'm. It's my. It's my mission. So it's either like don't kill Rufio if that's the case, or kill him and then let Pan be in charge, right? Yeah. So it's like, I think I think that's I think that's clear to me. You gotta kill him and then someone needs to take the, the reins, or you don't kill him and he just borrows the Lost Boys, and he, in the end, they just kind of they, they you just son of a bitch, yep. you know. I don't know. Rufio is just... It's very short change. For someone who has endeared as long as he has, he's a very underwritten character. Also, speaking of deaths, I think the weird non-ending for Hook doesn't work either. Yeah. He just... He, a the, statue of a... An alligator eats him? Or it falls on top falls of him and then he disappears. Yeah, it's very... Just shiv him. Come on. It's anticlimactic. Yeah. So. Or don't, have the alligator be alive still. I don't... I mean... Mm -hmm. It's just weird. I don't know. I yeah, feel like that's, I, a, that's another moment. I, I feel like that one is a real throwaway. Yeah. It's just, whoa, where did he go? He disappeared. And then it's, yeah, we're on to the next thing. It's like, Hook's death just didn't hold any weight at all. So, Kev, we know what you didn't like about the movie. Are there any small nitpicks you want to, not big things, just the small nitpicks like we always do? I will say, Julia Roberts, real wiggy. Uh, it's a real wiggy movie. Oh, boy. I think with Hook, they obviously. They obviously steer into that turn of it being Wiggy. 
uh, with Julia Roberts, it's just a real wigtastic thing. There's a lot of throwaway references to Peter Pan that they don't just build on. Like, there's the shadow whole thing. See, and I'm not familiar enough with Peter Pan. I'm like, and what? What's up with I, the shadow? I think I'm the same way. He, like, lost his shadow, if I remember right. And then... But they kind of play with that, but then it's just forgotten. And that's just empty screen time that you don't need. In a movie that's already too long, all those little moments just chop them out. The backstory of Peter Pan is as as a baby, he ran away because he didn't want to grow up. He's a baby? He's a baby. I, if well, he wanted to run away, he couldn't even move. It's like his his pram rolls down the, the hill and then that's it. Like nobody went to go look for it. They just forgot about it. It's just that whole... That whole backstory is just very, very. Strange. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta just fucking throw that away. It doesn't matter what that backstory is. Yep. He was Peter Pan. Now he's not. That's it. This movie is very garish looking. It is not pleasing to the eye. At all. What? There's not lots of color in this movie. It, but Colored lights when they're when when there's with the lots kids. of color and there's some parts that look really good. Most of the time, it just looks very cluttered and very ugly. I think. Mm. Cluttered and ugly. Just I, like that family's house. In oh, no, Mountain come Day. on. That's crazy yeah, talk. Okay, I won't go that far. That's, that's definitely crazy. The worst, that's definitely the that worst house, house That ever. house is like the fucking blob. You know <laughs> what I mean? It just grows and grows. <laughs> I don't know, it's just very... We need to, we need to get ugly, off this negativity train. Like Let's go to cool stuff. Cell phones with antennas. So very good. Strange. The past was awful. <laughs> As well as uh, lawyer jokes in the 90s. Just can't get away from them. There's, I think there's two or three lawyer jokes in this movie. To the 90s credit, mermaids with just shells on their boobs were closer than ever to freeing the nipple, but I just feel like that would not fly today. No. But in the 90s, you could just put some shell. T- we're just going to glue some shells to your boobs. That's what you are. There it is. Um... A lot of interesting cameos in this movie. Glenn Close is a pirate. Oh! Oh my god! I Glenn Close to, is a pirate. I forgot to mention, when I was a kid, I saw that scene. That scene disturbed oh, yeah. the fuck out of me. Like, That's awful. You're in a box full of scorpions, and it's called the Boo Box? That is fucked up. Ugh. That is some like child warping shit right there. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> but yeah, that's Glenn Close in like beard and... Uh, Men's clothing. Mm-hmm. Got David Crosby shows up as one of the pirates. Uh, he was in uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. Phil Collins is the oh. police guy that uh, when the kids first um, get taken take away, away, yeah, he's like the police inspector. See, and, and I get how those things work, but like, what, how is the decision made that Glenn Close should be a pirate? Is it like we have no female roles in this? So you but get but be a she's playing a male though. It's just I I just don't know. She's like I think it's one of those things where it's like oh I'm a, I'm friends with Glenn Close. What it wouldn't be funny if and then put her in a beard and she's a pirate. It's just also I saw I found it out after I watched this movie. I would have never known that. Oh yeah, she's completely. I only read that like recently, and then, yeah, looking at it, I'm like oh yeah that is Glenn Close, but you don't think about it so. The masthead of the boat is a gigantic skeleton. Is that what the masthead's called? I don't know. The front of the boat. The bow. The bow is a gigantic skeleton. That is cool. That's badass. I'm all for giant skulls and giant skeletons. Oh, yeah. Another, not necessarily a cameo, but young Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah. In this movie. That was like her second movie. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, baseball glove. What do you do with it? You can catch stuff with it, take hot stuff out of the oven, hit your sister with it. That's a great line. It is That's fun. a great line. Yeah. Um, I just discovered I've walked through that baseball diamond like a million times because it's in Culver City. Oh, really? It's at the, the, the at the top of the hill at the Culver City Park. Mm. I just just figured that out. Taking your uh, wiener shaped dog to that. that so, take, take him up there every now and then. Interesting. So. Um, and also uh, when they're like when they first get Peter Pan and she has all the pixie dust and then some random couple is floating. You know, it's like yeah. that's a cool moment. So. As we as big we get into the big picture of this thing, has nostalgia been too kind of this movie? I'll say no. You're gonna say yes. I say yes. I just maybe I need to see it one more time. Maybe I'm just in that place of like, I know what's coming at every step of it because I did watch it a lot when I was a kid, mm-hmm. and maybe just dreading like, I kind of just wanted to get on to the next thing because maybe I'm not the biggest fan of this part or this part, and I think that snowballed into a. This movie annoys me. Listen, listen, man. It's with all media, with all things. 
you start to not like it, and if it can't recover, it's a snowball effect. It's just everything rolls downhill. You know what I mean? And that's the nature. I think that's the nature of why I like this movie and you don't, right? Because it's like you don't like it, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And I like it, and it just gets better and better and better. I definitely liked it when I was a kid, and that's what's weird. It just this time, it just really graded. So, would you chalk those up to its excesses? Would I think you think so. it'd be better if it was toned down? I'm not toned down style wise. I think there's a lot you can trim down in this movie. There's like the scene where he's trying to teach the kids. The like weird scene where Hook is gonna commit suicide. I loved all that shit. I loved all I that shit. That streamlined completely. I'm gonna I'm gonna rant. I know we're already going long, but fuck it. Here's the thing. I feel like in my life, and stay with me, Kev. Stay with me. And in films and with all art and everything, people are always asking you to be. They're like, don't be so crazy. Don't be so bold, right? But it's like, okay, so if we're going to extrapolate that, it's like, what, you want me to be in the middle? You want me to be mediocre? You want me to be not offensive? And it's just like, and I get why, right? I get that you're, the idea that you're going to, if you go too far, you get crazy and no one likes it and it's offensive. But, and it's like, you want to stay away from being obnoxious and, and, and you know. But if you're going to, be something. If you're going to make something, it has to be bold because what do you like in your life that's not bold? You ever heard of the author Chuck Klosterman? No. He, he writes about pop culture a lot and sports. He, he's, he's a man of the world. Hmm. He's, he has this, uh, one, one of his books, he talks about, you know, just artists and musicians. He said the worst thing an artist could ever get is a three-star album review. Right. Because it's just right there smack in the middle. It's not great, but eh, it's okay. And it's like that's potentially the worst because it, because it's because it's probably something that they that they didn't reach the, the implication there right is greatness and tragedy are both achieved by reaching for greatness. Yep. Right. You either go for the gold and you get a gold, or you go for the gold and lose completely, get last, mm-hmm. and you can finish in the middle because in the middle you just do what you know works. Right. Is that, is that yep. the, the takeaway here? Yeah. And I just feel like I don't know, man. Like. I think in terms, if if this wasn't a Spielberg movie, I might give it a lot more leeway. Mm. This would be Chris Columbus's most ambitious movie he ever made. If 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 he were the one to make it, you know, Spielberg before this movie had proven time and time again that he's capable of making something great. Raiders of the Lost Ark, E. T. Um, like all the other Indiana Jones came out before this. Um, Jaws. It's he, you know he's capable of. Not only doing something bold and crazy, but getting a story that really pulls it all together, too. Mm -hmm. And I think he just really fails on the story part. The themes are there, but I think it gets really bogged down in the excesses. And I want to be clear. That's... If if you don't like this movie, and you say you go back and rewatch it, having had talked about this, and you still don't like it, that's totally fine. Film, personal medium, that's our thesis from day one. That's totally fine. The thing I don't like is how everyone... And by everyone, I mean the internet seems to complain about you know they hate mediocre things. They want something new. They want something different. But somehow, when something new or weird comes out, they don't like that. The re- this is weird. I don't know this. It's like if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. That's a fair thing to say. But to say like oh it's too it's too uh, it it has too lofty ambitions. It's like well what what else do you fucking want? Exactly. And I completely agree with you with that. I think this movie does not have lofty ambitions, though. I think it's got... And that's fair. That's a fair thing. That's a fair criticism, I think. Yeah, I think it's it's big and bold in that the sets are big, and it's kooky, and it's bizarre, and it doesn't give a fuck. And, you know, we're going to have Tinkerbell turn into a full-size woman for a brief moment, and then, like, have weird sexual tension for a second, and then go away. And we're just that sexual put... tension is real. We're just going to put that in there, and it's like, that... There's that kind of bold, and then there's it's this very not bold, ambitious story. And I think that's where the disconnect is for me. Mm. I think that's like surface level bold of just, we spent all this money and went X number of days over budget to have these big giant sets, and we took up all these sound stages, and it's it's just hollow to me. It's as hollow as that alligator. 
I just think that uh, this movie works and you're completely wrong. No, no. <laughs> wouldn't, no. Wouldn't be the first time. I just think that this movie is the polar opposite of Close Encounters. Oh, it definitely is. And I think I'll, that's my favorite part about it. It's, just, that's why I, it's not a perfect movie, but I think it's in the spirit of fun and I think there's way more good than bad. And that's why, going back to all the way back to the beginning of this episode, I think it's a very strictly for kids movie. It fills all your base desires that you want when you're a kid. It shows like this unbounded imagination in this world that anything can happen. We can put, we can just stage a pirate baseball game right in the middle. Just we got all the resources for that. We can just do it. We don't have to explain anything. The only caveat I'd say to that is that as a kid, this movie gives you hope that your dad will one day be a kid like you, which is not going to happen. But as an adult, it gives you hope that one day you'll just mellow out. Which could happen. Could. Should. Maybe. But yeah, I think that's why I really feel this doesn't resonate as much for me. It's just very much... I don't want to say it's pandering to kids. because I don't think this movie panders. But it's... It's all just pure surface level sugar rush kind of stuff. And I think that appeals way more to kids. And the intellectual part of me can't... Doesn't jive with that as mm. much. It's just... And then it's it's a two and a half hour thing. It's like I need something to engage me a little further than just look how big this set is. Look at how colorful this mermaid's hair is. Look at it was pretty colorful. It, it, many colors in that mermaid's hair. But it's to me, I just need that little extra thing to chew on, and that's why I lump this in as this is a kids movie. So is it in the filmography essential, status quo, or forgettable? I think it's. For me, it's forgettable, but I can see why people would latch on to it and have a lot more nostalgia for it. I, I definitely do remember watching it as a kid and enjoying it and like spending that time with my siblings and my cousins. Or I remember that as a kid. Maybe I'm just grumpy old Peter Pan now. Yeah, yeah. I can, but um, I just need a little something more to chew on to make me sit through two and a half hours of it. So I had a rough time with this watch. And I will just retort by saying... And I think what you're experiencing is not nostalgia, right? Where something that is from your childhood now sucks. Do you know what I'm saying? Is that a word? Is that, uh, is that an official word? Uh, there's a writer that writes, that I think works for IFC that, that uh, said okay. that, uh, Matt Singer. Not nostalgia. Not nostalgia coined that term, and I'm just going to go ahead and roll with it. I am not coming from a nostalgic place with this. Never seen this movie before. Don't particularly like the time it was made in. Not really a fan of the director on the whole, from what we've learned from this podcast. I'm not really a fan of the director <laughs> who made say, it. We're discovering that. Yeah. But I think this I like this movie a lot. I think it's a lot of fun as an adult. You know what I mean? To say it's essential is kind of like I don't know if it's essential. That's that's like that's like some lofty fucking goals to get to essential. Do you know what I'm saying? Yep. Like, yo, know, Jaws, this is not. But I think it's better than status quo and it's definitely not forgettable. It probably would work in the best context for children. You know what I mean? It's not perfect, but I, I liked it. I had a really good time with it. That, that's all we can hope for. That's all. See, I thought you were going to hate this thing. No, man. With, with as much as you think Spielberg is bloated. So I I was genuinely for shocked. Me, for, me, liked it. for me, I think this was a, a jello mold that you know had castles and turrets and little dudes on top. And for you, it was just a big pile of water that is a, <laughs> seep, you know... Fell out of the, the mold and is now on, all over your fucking fridge. You know what I mean? Just didn't come I, together. Yeah, just maybe. Too much water, not enough mix. You know, I don't know what happened. Too much of the, uh, too much sugar, not enough, not enough gelatin to hold it all together. I think that's what happened. This movie is jello. I, I think, I think. <laughs> is uh, it film just jello? I, I, it, it may just be. <laughs> that's it for us. This episode written by Kev. Music by Jeff Russell. We are speaking cinema. You are the listeners. Bangarang, everybody. Rufio. Oh!